As we face up to the climate crisis, it seems like two paths lay ahead, two distinct strategies for survival, a sort of Robert Frost poem for human civilization. Down one path, so we're told, we transform our relationship with nature, shedding the metastases of toxic heavy industries, of intensive animal agriculture, and internal combustion engines for a simpler, slower way of life. Down the other road, we continue to do what humans have always done, invent and innovate, relying on our creative, entrepreneurial spirit to improve our conditions, extend nature's limits, and tailor the planet to our needs. I'll lay my cards on the table right up front. I'm something of a technologically adept Luddite. I'll take the simple life. Whereas I can't accept any version of the simple life that doesn't involve a fully-fledged internet. Technology may be a defining feature of humanity. Other creatures use tools, build shelter, and some, like beavers, even manufacture and maintain whole ecosystems. But we are unmatched in our ability to copy, remix, and improve. To pass designs down through generations, and to embrace the solutions of others. So in an era when a lone inventor or a team of engineers can touch billions of lives, what are the odds that someone, somewhere, might just crack the code? They could discover how to pull all of our carbon dioxide from the air and save us all from disaster. Would everything else just carry on, the same as it ever was? But what if they already did? What if it's not enough? And what if they need our help? Dragons have been a part of our lives since ancient times, standing on the threshold between us and some kind of transformative change. In this series, we're on the lookout for a special sort of dragon. While you can't see their bodies, you can see their tracks. These are the dragons of climate inaction. Their habitat is in our minds. And this podcast is your field guide. Welcome to Chapter 2, Techno Salvation. This is Scales of Change, a field guide to the dragons of climate inaction. Join us as we learn to spot them in the wild and discover how they can be disarmed. Produced by Future Ecologies on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wusainich peoples, with support from the University of Victoria. Welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, and you're wondering, dragons? What dragons? This whole thing might make a little more sense if you go back and listen to the introductory episode, called A Theory of Change. Today, we'll be discussing the second of seven genera of dragons, ideologies. Ideologies are our core guiding principles, our filters for understanding the world, usually inherited from our families and our communities. Ideologies are broad, I like to think of them as broad umbrella constellations of attitudes and values and ideas, which don't all have to do with climate change. Once again, this is Robert Gifford environmental psychologist and collector of the Dragons of Inaction. Oh, and I'm Adam. This is Mendel. Hey! And like Robert said, an ideology is more than just one belief. It's like the fabric that connects all sorts of beliefs together. And while the details will always differ from person to person, for the most part, these beliefs come packaged as sets. You know, the obvious one is the kind of liberal conservative spectrum. There's kind of a conventional understanding that lefty liberal types have environmental values at heart. We can't allow this magnificent old growth forest to be logged. It's a tragic mistake. While right-wing conservatives are more concerned with private property. Loggers who showed up for work weren't happy about being blocked from their jobs. Got to make your payments, earn a living, stink. But in practice, this plays out all sorts of ways at least in terms of ecology. I have two grandfathers who are very right-wing ideologically, but they are much more attuned to nature and much better stewards of land than my more liberal parents. 
there are some people who are generally political conservative who will look at the root of the word into conservation. So there are plenty of folks who identify as fiscally or socially conservative, but are concerned with the overextraction of natural resources or the environmental threats posed by the climate crisis. But by and large, strong beliefs in things like the primacy of free market capitalism usually imply other beliefs. Like the idea that the only limit on the exploitation of the natural world is our personal desire and ability. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. This sort of outlook is an example of a worldview, which is actually one of the dragons in this genus. Another ideological dragon that gets in the way of climate action is a belief in superhuman powers, that forces beyond human control have relieved us of any agency. I mean, there's not that many people now that think there's a kind of a god up in the sky who's controlling everything. But what I like to say is there is a body of people who have the secular version of that, that essentially Mother Nature's in control. That's the other superhuman being. And translated, uh, this is a natural cycle. And so therefore, I don't have to do anything because it's a natural cycle. So that's pretty common, especially in de denial of skeptic uh, circles. The dragon of suprahuman powers encourages us to avoid facing any possibility that our warming planet is of our own making, and the implicit fact that then we should have some responsibility to reverse the damage. Some might think that our survival is preordained. Or the kind of opposite, edgy flip side, which is that human beings are a kind of planetary infection, and that climate change and pandemics are just the Earth's immune system. Right, which is an attitude that really bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a, it's, a, it's a negative form of human exceptionalism. And it has kind of an evangelical flavor to it, right? Right, yeah. It, it kind of rejects any call to mitigate the suffering that we are inflicting and reimagine the systems that are actually causing harm. Totally. And that takes us to the next dragon of ideologies. System justification. Which is the belief that things are simply the way they are meant to be. That we are living in the best of all possible worlds. Which is something you tend to believe if the system seems to be working in your favor. Right, and for example, my father spent the last 15 years of his life as a climate activist. But he told me that before that, he basically assumed that most leaders had everyone's best interests at heart. And that companies, like the companies that he worked for, were serving the social good. That's what he was raised on, and that's what he believed for much of his life. It took a major life crisis to cause him to take a closer look at our systems and see how they weren't serving or, or even set up to serve the vast majority of people, which is something that the climate crisis exposes in stark terms. And that kind of trust in benevolent, powerful strangers brings us to the fourth and final species of this genus, the dragon of techno-salvation. So techno-salvation uh, means I don't have to do anything because the engineers will solve the problem. People have to buy the in innovations that the <laughs> engineers are making and accept them. So no, you can't, you, you can't escape your responsibility by putting all the onus on engineers. The idea behind techno-salvation is pretty well spelled out in its name, that through technology, we'll be able to fix the climate and maintain the status quo in the process, because we'll swap out all of our dirty habits for clean lookalikes. Like with electric cars, we'll all still drive everywhere, but hey, at least it's electrons turning those tires and not exploding plankton from the Mesozoic era. Exactly. Or an even more extreme version will damn the risks and find a way to adjust the climate directly through geoengineering. Think massive efforts to reflect the heat of the sun or to fertilize the ocean with iron. Or failing that, we'll just bail on this planet and terraform Mars instead. <laughs> Honestly, uh, the billionaires can have Mars if they want it. I think a one-way ticket for some of these would-be saviors might actually be a good investment from a planetary perspective. <laughs> In any case... Um, for people who believe that any of those futures are realistic and practical, 
all of the action is just out of their hands, right? The solutions are coming from engineers in lab coats. Or tech bros in t-shirts. Any kind of magnanimous expert, really, ready to swoop in and save the day in the third act. It's a real deus ex machina. Yeah, a, a literal god in the machine. Techno Salvation is easily one of the most dangerous dragons. Not just that it discourages systemic change, but also because it's future-focused. It neglects proven technologies and some game-changing innovations that are just coming online now. They aren't enough to save us on their own, but they're critical to any realistic response to the climate crisis. And here's one that may not be so far-fetched. Pulling all of our excess CO2 directly from the air. You mean, like trees do? Yes. Except the problem is that trees just may not be able to do it fast enough. What we're doing by... Uh, in our industrial age is we're taking the result of millions and millions and millions of years of basically trees, mostly. We're using organic material that over tens and hundreds of millions of years got buried and we're burning that. So to think that we could just take the current land today and solve the entire problem by planting more trees as the population uh, is growing still is a bit unrealistic. Okay, who's that? That's Kevin Kaners. He's actually another podcaster. Uh, a Canadian living in Berlin. His show is called The Elephant, and he did a four-hour-long deep dive into exactly what we're talking about. Negative emissions technologies. Negative emissions. So, like, uh, subtracting CO2. Exactly. Got it. And what Kevin is saying is that we simply have a scale problem. Photosynthesizers spent millions of years collecting and condensing all of that carbon, and it's only taken us a few centuries to put it all the way back into the atmosphere. Right, so if we want to make enough of an impact on the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air, we'll have to accelerate that process somehow. Yeah, and there's actually two big challenges there. One is pulling it out of the air, and the other is storing it somewhere safe forever. And at scale too, right? Like, trees and wetlands and peatlands are slow, but they do operate at scale and run entirely on solar power. If we want to speed up that process technologically, we need something similarly scalable, but that doesn't require more energy and hence more emissions than it can sequester, right? Bingo. And it's not like people haven't been trying. Scientists have seen carbon dioxide and climate change coming a mile away. There have been lots of breakthroughs, but the pace has been a lot slower than you'd expect especially given how clearly important the problem is. Kevin met with scientists who have been working on direct air capture since the 1990s, and what he points out is that this kind of sluggish development wasn't actually a technical issue. But the the bigger challenge I really found was uh, economic, in that there's no one really paying anyone to take carbon dioxide out of the air, so there's no real economic driver that would kind of be pushing this technology and helping it to, to develop in the way that solar or, or wind did, where it you know gets a lot cheaper over time by the just pure refining of the of the technology and the, the manufacturing processes. Okay, so you can't make a business case on carbon like you would on electricity. But that's what research grants are for, right? Yeah, you you'd think so. But for a long time the idea of negative emissions technology sat in this funny kind of ideological limbo. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good way to put it. The green groups tend to not like carbon capture because they see it as being a friend of fossil fuels, kind of like the indulgences that the the Catholic Church used back in the day. We can just like pay for our sins. And that is kind of against the, the messaging that they've used and the philosophical belief that most have had. And on the other hand, well, if you don't believe climate change is is real, then we definitely don't need a technology to take CO2 out of the air. If you're someone who is too pro on uh, technology and then you're not worried because everything will magically happen somehow, I guess. So for the environmentalists, carbon capture was seen as a kind of get out of jail free card. And by funding it and pursuing it, the the fear was that it could imply that it's okay for everyone to keep using fossil fuels. And for everyone else, climate change just 
wasn't a pressing issue. So why spend money on things like pulling carbon out of the sky? So only really a handful of scientists dedicated themselves to the cause, piecing together whatever funding they could. The Dragon of Worldviews was definitely playing both sides here. (laughs) Yeah. But then, just in the last decade, there was a reckoning. And it's actually one that I bet most listeners won't be familiar with. I'm actually not sure that I know what you're referring to either. Uh, can, Can you fill me in? Well, you remember the IPCC report in 2018, right? I do remember that. It felt like that report finally made everyone sit up and pay attention. For a hot minute, anyway. The IPCC... The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Yeah, they spelled out just how much more carbon we can afford to emit, and how long we have to get on budget, and it was chilling. All the headlines were about how serious it was for us to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Right. But what didn't really seem to get as much attention, and wasn't in any headlines that I noticed is the fact that practically all of those carbon budget calculations are counting on us bringing some kind of gigaton-scale carbon capture online by 2050. Every single uh, pathway that they identified involve carbon removal from the air in some capacity, and even the the least generous ones included it, or like the ones that assume that we will overshoot 1.5 degrees and then come back somehow, i.e. through negative emissions, But even the ones that don't have us overshooting 1.5, which means that like we need to cut at unbelievable rates in order to get to zero emissions, they still assume removing carbon from the air. Every projection from the IPCC for a 1.5 or 2 degree future calls for large scale carbon dioxide removal before mid-century. Negative emissions technologies aren't a get out of jail free card anymore. They're an indispensable part of the solution. I guess being a Luddite is no longer an option. In no way do these technologies mean that uh, we shouldn't mitigate. Uh, In fact, it really only makes sense if you do mitigate because right now we're releasing something like 40 billion tons of CO2 each year, which is just a massive amount to deal with. And there's still so much low-hanging fruit. So ditching fossil fuels as fast as possible is still the name of the game, right? Yeah, and on that note, there's another thing that I want to point out. Something else I think isn't as widely known as it ought to be. And what would that be? Well, uh, I I actually have a little pop quiz for you. Uh, <laughs> if, if I burn a kilo of gasoline, how much carbon dioxide do you think I'm releasing? Like, uh, how much does the carbon dioxide weigh? Yeah, exactly. I can't believe you're putting me on the spot for this. <laughs> um, a kilogram of gas. I, I can hardly even think in metric, Mendel. Um, <laughs> it's it's probably... This feels like a trick question. Would it be all of it? Like, if, if I burn a kilo of gas, wouldn't I just release one kilo of carbon dioxide? It is kind of a trick question. Because for every kilogram of gasoline burned, 2.3 kilograms of CO2 goes into the atmosphere. What? How can it weigh more than double what you started with? It's kind of a a cruel joke, right? Most of that weight is actually that O2, and that's coming from the air. It's oxygen from the air bonding with the carbon from the gasoline. That, that's not fair. Nope, that's combustion. We're not gonna change every single machine in the world in the next like 12 years. Every single ship, every single plane, every single locomotive, you know, every single home that is heated with gas. So the only way to really imagine that we can get to zero emissions, either, you know, by 2050 or 10 years from now, is through some sort of negative emissions. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, in terms of actually pulling carbon out of the air, there are quite a few different technologies that are being developed. Kevin focused his podcast series on the work of Klaus Lackner out of Arizona State University. And as it so happens, There's another direct air capture project in our own backyard here in BC. That's carbon engineering in Squamish. They're both demonstrating really encouraging progress in terms of energy efficiency, cost, and scalability. But the more interesting question to me is, once we have all that carbon, hopefully billions of tons of it, where do we put it? And that's why I reached out to Kate. Uh, I'm Kate Moran, president and CEO of Ocean Networks Canada. Ocean Networks Canada. 
I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that they're not looking to bury carbon in the desert. <laughs> Ocean Networks Canada is leading an international research project called Solid Carbon. It's launched by the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions at UVic, or PICS for short. Their plan is to demonstrate the feasibility of using what may be the best place to store our excess carbon dioxide, the basaltic seafloor. If you if you took the water out of the ocean and were able to look at the planet, um, it, we're, it's covered in basalt. It forms all the tectonic plates, so the edges of them are these spreading centers that form basalt. So it's, it's a huge reservoir. Just compare it to offshore oil reservoirs, they're only on the continental shelves. They're not a tiny part of the ocean. This is huge parts of the ocean. So the reservoir is gigantic. So what, what Kate is saying is that if we use basalt to store carbon dioxide, then we really have the room to sequester all of our atmospheric carbon? Yeah. That's good news, I guess. But uh, just backing up, how are they planning to use this rock to hold carbon dioxide in the first place? It's a bit complicated. Well, Kevin had a lot more time to go into the details. So if detail is your thing, you should listen to the five episodes of The Elephant from 2019. But I'll give you a quick overview. Great. Okay, so if the name Solid Carbon didn't tip you off, they're going to transform all of that carbon dioxide gas into solid rock. CO2, either dissolved in water or injected as a pressurized gas, gets pumped into the basalt, where it can react with the iron and magnesium and calcium in the rock. And then it turns into a kind of mineral called a calcite. Uh, how, how long does that take? So this kind of chemical reaction is actually taking place all the time on land. It's called weathering. Uh, under natural conditions, it takes millions of years for CO2 to fall out of the sky as acid rain and then react with the various kinds of basic rocks on the surface. But basalt has even more going for it because it's full of all these tiny cracks and voids, little pockets all the way through the rock. By injecting CO2 directly into basalt, there's so much surface area that the reaction can come to completion in just a couple of years. That's wild. Is, is, it, is it theoretical or has it, has it been proven? You could say it's rock solid. Four years ago, Icelandic researchers and engineers, a group called CarbFix, injected carbon dioxide into basalt on Iceland. And Iceland is part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Which means that the island is made of basaltic seafloor, pushed up by tectonic movement. Just happens to stick above the surface of the ocean. Making Iceland especially suitable for a land-based proof of concept. CarbFix partnered with a geothermal power plant to inject CO2 underground and track how it mineralized. They demonstrated that the CO2 would become solid rock in two years. So it would transform from this gas that's in the atmosphere causing us problems to permanently removed. And you can find pictures of the rock cores that they made. All the bubbles in the gray basalt have been filled by white calcites from the CO2. Kate and Solid Carbon are trying to take it to the next steps, demonstrate how we can scale this system up, and bring this huge reservoir of oceanic basalt into play, which means proving it can be done at sea. If, you could, if people who are listening can picture you have a floating platform, uh, you have renewable energy on it, it's likely a lot of it's going to be offshore wind because of the, the dominance of power that it can generate. You have a drill string, basically, a tube, three kilometers long, from the platform to the seafloor, and you pump that captured CO2 through the water column down about 300 meters beneath the seafloor. And that tube would then have perforations in it that go into the formation. And then in short amount of time becomes rock. You know, by the sounds of it, it this project is I ironically going to look a lot like an offshore oil well. Except that instead of tapping fossil carbon from millions of years ago, it'll be running in reverse, pumping carbon back into the ground. Totally. And I think you've hit on a, a funny kind of tension there. If we're going to keep global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees, it looks like we have to include these solutions that, in some ways, look a lot like the heavy industry we're trying to replace. 
Although the upside is that we might even be able to recycle some existing oil infrastructure, or at least the tooling and the know-how. We have the ability then to demonstrate that in fact, we can take our extractive industries and transition to non-carbon intensive industry. And so not only is it a technology development, it's a social construct that could demonstrate to the world that this is possible. I encounter this dynamic in my work in ecological restoration all the time. Like when, when there's been damage to an ecosystem caused by heavy machinery, that same machinery is often the best and most efficient tool to undo that damage and, and to set the ecosystem on a better trajectory. But um, before we get into uh, I don't know, like too good to be true, maybe a little close to techno salvation territory, we are seriously talking about a planetary intervention here, right? Like, how sure are we that this is safe? Well, that's part of what Solid Carbon is planning to find out. According to smaller studies, the risks of leaks and seismic disturbance or any other disruption to life on the seafloor, besides the drill string itself, should actually all be minimal. Besides the drill string itself kind of begs the question, how much drilling we're actually going to have to do. Yeah. So exactly how much carbon dioxide they can pack into one 300 meter deep well is yet to be determined by tracking how much that plume of carbon dioxide spreads out or not. But what happens now in the oil industry is that you can have one wellhead and then you can actually be drilling horizontally into the reservoir from that one location. You know, despite myself, I'm actually getting into the idea of co-opting all this oil technology to fight climate change. But this is all still in the planning stages, right? I mean, how far off is this really? At the moment, they're working out the details and getting approvals to go ahead with a field trial, hopefully in 2025. The hope is not only to prove that the system works and can affordably pump carbon back into the crust, but to actually stress test the system, try to force a CO2 leak and see what happens. And that's part of why Ocean Networks Canada is leading the project. They're already set up with extensive deep sea monitoring systems. So if anything happens, they'll know about it. Right. But for, for now, we just, we, we don't know. Well, no. And we won't really know until we try. And even then, you know, maybe not for a long time. But even if we don't try, it's not like we've opted out of transforming the planet. What we're doing right now by burning all this fossil fuel is the biggest geoengineering experiment that we've ever done. Like, you're in it. You're part of the lab team doing the geoengineering experiment. Stop it. The sooner we can get off fossil fuels, the less we're going to be dependent on projects like solid carbon to push that carbon back into the ground. Yeah, and I, I agree with Kate. We've been making planetary scale interventions unintentionally for a long, long time, and it's clear where that's gotten us. Which says to me that we need to think very carefully about how we intervene going forward and why. Responding to the dragon of techno salvation means that we can't place all of our hopes in heroic, untested technological solutions. But in this case, it, it also means using the tools currently at our disposal. All that being said, for those of us who don't wear lab coats, how do we address this dragon of techno salvation? It, it seems like the issue here is that we have a tendency to be so focused on waiting for some technological silver bullet in the future that we neglect to embrace existing technologies. We certainly need engineers and other technical people to come up with the solutions on the mechanical side or on the science side, but those solutions aren't always well accepted by the average person in terms of tax dollars to pay for grants or in their own households or whatever. So uh, the natural scientists often ask me how they can make some of their good technical solutions more acceptable to the general public. I think that comes back to the main problem that Kevin identified, 
the reason why it took so long for direct air capture to be taken seriously for research and development. No one wanted to invest in carbon capture because carbon itself has no value. No one was going to pay to take it back out of the air. But that's finally changing. Just this last week, Microsoft is now committed to actually repaying back all of their, the emissions for their entire lifetime of the corporation. They're going to need negative emission technology in order to fulfill that commitment. BP did that yesterday. They finally get it that you need a livable planet to grow your business. So I just think that market's going to grow. I think that is really cool. And if that idea could spread, not just like from one or two businesses that are have now made that pledge to universities or to, you know, even provinces or states or countries, then I think that would be a, a really huge step that uh, normal people could could make potentially. It's going to take that kind of social pressure, making our institutions recognize their responsibility for this pollutant and pay for its cleanup. We need negative emissions just as much as we need to stop releasing CO2. The sooner we can accept that, the sooner we can normalize it as part of the solution. Then those technologies will become cheaper and more diverse. And for all of my fellow Luddites out there, at least those of you who are in the Venn diagram of Luddite and podcast listener, um, it's cool. We can still keep planting trees. Please keep planting trees. Whatever you're in a position to do, do that thing. And together, we'll save each other. When you're in a position where you can do something, you better do it. This has been Chapter 2 of Scales of Change, a field guide to the dragons of climate inaction. We'll be back next week with Chapter 3, Writing on the Wall. Whether or not we can avoid climate collapse is still an open question. But we know for sure, one thing is inevitable. Change. Scales of Change is a production of Future Ecologies, with support from the University of Victoria. In this chapter, you heard Robert Gifford, Kevin Kaners, Kate Moran, myself, Adam Huggins, and me, Mendel Skolsky. Huge thanks to Susanna Hearn, Anne McLaurin, Anya Krieger, Simone Miller, Ilana Fenaryov, and Leslie Elliott. Besides discovering the dragons of inaction, Robert Gifford is literally the author of the textbook, Environmental Psychology, Principles, and Practice. Kevin Kaners is a journalist and the podcaster behind The Elephant, which is a must listen if you're interested in the intricacies and history of carbon capture and storage. There are just tons of fascinating details that we had to skip. Kate Moran is Solid Carbon's principal investigator and president and CEO of Ocean Networks Canada, a UVic initiative. You can learn more about the project at solidcarbon.ca. Our theme song and composition for this chapter was by Lom Zoku. Other music was provided by Jack Hertz, Parallel Park, Blear Moon, Soda Light, Pictures of the Floating World, Daniel Birch, and Sunfish Moonlight. You can tweet at us or follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Future Ecologies. To learn more about each one of the dragons of inaction, including silly things like the Latin names we gave them, go to futureecologies.net slash dragons. All right, that's it. We'll see you next week.